Good morning, church. Hopefully you're enjoying the service and you're going to get outside and enjoy some really nice weather uh, today. Um, <laughs> I've recorded this in advance, so hopefully it's not raining. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, so let's get into the word. The book of Numbers shouldn't have been, um, well, I guess it should have been written, but like it shouldn't have been so long, really. Uh, a journey that took that took 40 years should only have taken uh, 11 days really on foot and so something's really gone wrong uh, we need to find out what went wrong um, and uh, ask the question uh, why why was this book written in the first place in the sense that like, there's so much that that's gone wrong in it um, I guess the Bible is quite honest in that sense that it re records a lot of um, faults and things like this but our answer to that question, in fact, um, why was it written, um, lies in uh, the book of Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, it says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so really, that's that's why um, it, that's why it's recorded. So we, so we the, the, the you know current church, uh, can learn from from you know, God's dealings with the children of Israel. And um, so we, we, we've got we've got God leading them out of Egypt and then he's leading them to the promised land. Should have taken 11 days, it's taken 40 years. What's gone wrong? Basically, there's, I mean, there's miracles all around the, the children of Israel as well. Um, you know, you've got the pillar of, of smoke and a cloud even and the pillar of fire leading them like day and night and then you've got uh you've got manna from heaven all sorts of things were you know part of the red sea all of this stuff that's going on um but yet i believe that it became too casual they became too too overly familiar with um with the presence of god um and i think this book is reminding us not to do that not to be too casual with the presence of God. Um, we, we're, we're to take God seriously, you know. Um, if we um, and and again and again we were we were warned of this. I mean, even in that same same passage in Corinthians, in verse ten uh, of chapter ten, it says, "Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer." Previously to that, in verse nine, it says, "Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted." and were destroyed by serpents so yeah again um you know the, the, in that casualness in that blase kind of attitude to to god it brought upon them destruction by various um various means which god actually sent interestingly enough um you know and again they, they became they were they, they developed this kind of overly entitled attitude which again to the, in today's church we can we can fall into that trap and so the book of numbers is here to to warn us of not not to be um not to be too, too overly entitled in, in in god's kind of uh in in god's presence and and in his, and, and his church in general um it's a it's a very uh, dangerous place to be um so what what was it in particular that they were doing um that 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 really angered God to these things, and here we have a, another answer in the book of Psalms, one o six, verse uh, twenty four to twenty five. Um, the psalmist is writing. He says, "Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord." And it goes on to say, "Therefore he sent." this uh, serpents among them and uh, you know said that they were going to die in the wilderness and all sorts um but what interestingly enough so they the, the sin was the initial sin was was that they were grumbling and they were complaining against god a god that you know by his hand <laughs> done so much for them and they, they, they were still weren't happy overly entitled that they were you know overly casual with god um and uh interestingly enough they like how david points out that uh, they grumbled in their tents um this is really interesting in the sense that like yeah, I, I guess this miracle making god um they became so blinded by by their grumbling by so so blinded by their casual kind of attitude to god they thought that he wouldn't hear them just because they were in 
their tent, just separated by a sheet of cotton or whatever it would have been. That's all, and 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 God can't hear them, kind of thing. They forgot who he was. Omnipresent, he's everywhere, you know. And so uh, we need to 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 be mindful of this as well, also. Um, and sometimes I think again, it, it's kind of a parallel to how Jesus addresses sin in the heart, doesn't he? He says, like you know, when he was talking to some guy, he says, "Oh, you know, if, even if you've looked at a woman um, with lust in." your heart you've committed adultery um and so i guess sin we can entertain sins in our hearts and it's just as good as us committing those very sins very much similar to to the israelites rumbling in their tents thinking that god uh, can't see but he sees all things and he's the tester of hearts isn't he so again we really must be um wary of this um and be honest, and I guess it's a, it's a sign that whether we're following wholeheartedly or not, you know, if our hearts, if we've got anything in there held against him. Again, in uh, Psalm 51, I think David says, uh, you desire truth in the inward part and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Something along those lines. But again, that's what God wants. He wants truth in our hearts. He wants, he wants, he wants Jesus in our hearts. He wants his spirit addressing our hearts constantly yeah um and so moving on uh, we see that the, the israelites have been they've been led um and they're in this this kind of valley and again grumbling and complaining and god sends god sends uh snakes to the towards them to, to bite them and uh these fiery serpents they bite and they kill uh, people are dying out left right and center until finally they come to their senses um they come to their senses and um the ones that are left i guess um say you know we've sinned against you and we've sinned uh, meaning god and we've sinned we've sinned against god and we've sinned against you moses please play, pray moses to god um and, and and find a way out for us like tell tell him to stop sending these serpents um yeah basically we're dying right so um and, and and God provides a way out. He provides. He says. He says um, to Moses, you know, make a make a fiery serpent. Uh, and Moses builds. A, he he makes a, a bronze serpent and he puts it up. And whoever looks on the serpent, it says that he lived. Um, and this is a really really interesting place actually because we see a lot of of God's character here just in this one happening. You've got um, again the severity of God where. Uh, you know, the, the people grumbled against God, they sinned against God, and so God had to punish it because he's holy and he doesn't like sin. Uh, also, that it shows that, in a, in a sense, that he's a person, that when you cause offence, he's, he's, he's got it. It's God. <laughs> like he's, he, he has every right to get angry, okay? And so he sent, he sent the serpents to, to bite them off. And, and, and so that's a very severe way of, of, of dealing with with sin and with his people but then he is a loving father who wishes for nobody to perish you know he's wanting all his children to get to the promised land he's not taking them just so they can die off as they thought he's taking them so they can all have life and so and even again in the in the scripture where it says whoever looked at the serpent lived and so it was, it, this is god's intention for us to have life and uh but we see the love of God um, and then we see the, the severity of God. Um, I believe in the middle of that, with, uh, informed by these two things, is his righteousness. God is always going to do what is right. And he's, he still does this today. He's always going to do what is right in a sense that he, he still is God. And so um, he will always deal with sin in the same way. The, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life, you know. Um, so both things are informed by Him, yeah. And so it, it, those, those, sorry, both things. But so the, the severity of God and the, the love of God are always going to inform His righteousness. Always going to inform, inform His righteousness. So He's always going to do the right thing. He's never going to do the wrong thing. He's always going to do the right thing. And um, also, like. What's interesting about this passage is, is it points us forward to to Jesus on the cross, where um, 
on that on that uh, topic of sin being punishable, but then also the mercy of God as well. It's Jesus on the cross, isn't it? It's him dying for our sins and the wrath of God being poured out on him. <laughs> we should have been on that cross. We should have been the ones to die. But and but God in his mercy <laughs> uh, provided he, he provided a way out through sending his own son his only begotten son to die for us on the on on the cross and so um it, it's i mean it's so powerful isn't it like the, the, when those two things come together and and the, <laughs> so the deal that the, the deal that we get out of that whole situation um we don't necessarily lose anything we we gain everything we gain christ we gain uh <laughs> access and knowledge and of the father we gain the father's love and acceptance we get eternal life and um all because jesus took on him the wrath of god you know the the punishment the the, the death he tasted death and then we get you know all of this in in return i mean if that's not a good god then <laughs> i don't know who is yeah um but really like I think it comes down to this when when we look at uh, so obviously I'm I'm, I'm going to refer to John three sixteen now uh, where we know this very much to be our our modern gospel where it says um, for whoso uh, sorry for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life okay but it doesn't mention um, repentance there it doesn't re mention the offense to God in that in that scripture which has been taken out of the context of John 3 14 which is from numbers as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert in the desert so must the son of man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life so again, so now we have the entirety of the context of what John 3.16 was about. It's really, again, this is more an of an encouragement to believers. This is an encouragement to us, the church today, to carry on believing in Jesus Christ. Again, even in the way that the manner in which it's written, we've got limitations on our uh, English language that don't quite translate from the Greek. And so we don't have this present continuous tense. But the word believes there is actually goes on believing. So if you go on believing in Christ, you have, you go on believe, go on having eternal life. Yeah. Um, but the repent, the sin thing must be dealt with. And even in the book of Numbers, when we see when the, the people, they realized that they were in offense to God, they repented. They said, we're in offense to God and Moses. Um and then they pray to Moses and, and, and the rest of the story unfolds. But the, the repentance was a, a key part of, of, of the turnaround for them. And very much so, the repentance is a key part in the life of anybody who, wants, who wishes to approach God. We must realize that our sin offends God. Our sin, God doesn't want to entertain with anything else but death. But in God's mercy, he provides that <laughs> death in his son, which is just so beautiful. So I just, again, want to encourage in closing to, 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 our, to, to, to the church, just to really just to hold on to Jesus, just to continue believing in him, continue putting your trust wholeheartedly in him. We're coming out of lockdown. Um, things are accelerating again. Life is going to start getting in the way. Life is tough. There's been many situations I'm sure so, uh, many of us have faced through the, the virus and so forth. Uh, perhaps some of us have even lost some people and we're asking questions. But I want you to continue to put your trust in Jesus. He is leading us to our promised land. He's leading us to a new kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness abounds, where righteousness dwells, it says. And it, it's only in him, it's only in Jesus Christ that we have this, this promise. I really want you to, uh, to, to just hold on to Jesus, to, to really put your faith and trust, to look to him and, and receive your life. If you're an unbeliever and you're listening to this message, um, again, uh, I have to be honest with you. We've learned today that sin offends God. 
And so there is, if you've never repented, then clearly, if you really, if you, if you want to receive eternal life, if you want to have your sins forgiven by a loving father who wishes nothing but to give you eternal life and to get to know you and to love you, to, to, to clean you up, to, to, um, to bring you out of a kingdom of darkness into his eternal eternal light, into, into his life, then you have to repent. You have to bring your sin to him. You have to realize that you are in, a, in offense to God and that the path that you are on now is only going to lead you to death. So you have to repent and then put your trust in him. Look to him like, the Israelites looked to the serpent and lived, and he will bring you to that place. Your relationship can start now, today, with him, if you're serious. Okay? Amen.